In my talk this evening is going to be telling you a little bit about uh, the aquatic plants that we get in Chalk Stream. Aquatic plants, also known as macrophytes, I'll use the two terms interchangeably. Um, there'll be three parts to my talk this evening. The first is just to give a brief introduction to aquatic plants in chalk streams. Many of you will be familiar with the species and the patterns already, but I just want to make sure we're all starting from the same place. Then I'll go on to talk a little bit about why aquatic plants are important in chalk streams, the roles they fulfil. And finally, talk about what factors actually influence the aquatic plant community, in particular the abundance of plants that you get in a particular reach, which I hope will be useful um, for people interested in aquatic plant conservation and restoration. So firstly, just to talk a little bit um, about aquatic plants in chalk streams. Here's a typical section of the River Froome in Dorset, uh, one of the most southerly chalk streams. And as you can see, a very plant-rich river you can see this is taken in springtime, uh, late spring, when the white flowers of water crowfoot, one of the key species in this uh, habitat, uh, has come into bloom. And water crowfoot is arguably uh, one of the key species we have in chalk streams, one of the real uh, keystone species within this ecosystem. It's very distinctive. Many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with it. It's a long trailing plant. Um, very rich green in colour, which produces these pretty little buttercup flowers, um, which is no surprise because it's actually very closely related to the buttercups that we get in our meadows. Another key species in chalk streams is starwort, uh, calytrachy. We get a, as with ranunculus, we get a number of different species as we go around our chalk streams in the country. Particularly with starwort, we get the blunt fruit of starwort is a particularly common one, as calytrachy obtuse angular. These are very much uh, characteristic species of chalk streams. But in certain more degraded uh, reaches, particularly those where there's a slightly slower flow uh, and slightly higher nutrient concentrations, we're increasingly seeing species such as this, perfoliate pondweed, which you can also recognise from the slightly stubby sort of brownish coloured flowers you, you can see coming off of uh, the stems there. Um, particularly in the, the lower Froome Valley, uh, where I've done my PhD work, uh, that's going to actually really dominate um, the aquatic plant community. And then we also have um, some emergent plant species, in particular watercress and fool's watercress, as you can see there, uh, which particularly as late spring turns into summer, turns into autumn, become increasingly dominant and encroach um, from the sides onto the main channel. So these are some of the key species um, that we see in chalk streams. The species vary very much from river to river and from site to site within a river. Uh, it's not uncommon to have 20 to 30 species of aquatic plants in a single reach uh, in a, a good-sized chalk stream. Alternatively, you may find you only have a few strands of ranunculus. And hopefully, as I move on to talk about uh, what factors influence it, that might become clear why. The aquatic plants, um, and in particular ranunculus water crowfoot, show very clear seasonal patterns um, in chalk streams. This is from my own work on the Dorset Froome. Uh, two different measures of the amount of aquatic plant in a stream. You've got biomass, which is simply the weight of water weed essentially in, in a reach, and cover, which is the two-dimensional cover. You think of it as essentially the percentage of the riverbed which is covered in plants. Both show a strong increase as we go through spring into early summer, reaching a period around about July. That peak tends to be a little bit earlier in the headwater reaches and a little bit later in the further downstream reaches before eventually, post-July, the aquatic plant community senesces and dies off. Ranunculus itself uh, never dies off completely. There will always be some residual ranunculus right through the winter, even in very bad spate conditions. Most of the plants do actually um, die off and don't have any above-ground um, material during the winter, but ranunculus in particular uh, does keep that everyone, everyone presence in the winter. Because ranunculus at the very start of the season is generally the only one with its head above the gravel, it gets a bit of a head start and so um, as we move on through the season other species become more visible, start to join it um, and you can see here this is from our data in the River Froome. By September there's been a steady increase as other species um, have emerged and consequently the uh, dominance of water crowfoot declines, but still, even in September at its lowest, it's still comprising about 75% of the plant material as ranunculus. In other chalk streams, it may be calytrachy that forms the dominant biomass, but generally between those two plants, often they are the, the key ones. 
And I mentioned earlier about the uh, aquatic uh, flowers that water crow produces, and you can see these generally start being produced um, as May turns, um, turns into June and July, being gone by the time that, that August comes around. Again, there's a slight upstream-downstream pattern in the timing of flowering. Hugh Dawson's work on the River Piddle in Dorset showed that very nicely from the 1970s, that there's uh, more than two-week uh, gap between the start of flowering at the very highest sites and the start of flowering at the very lower sites. So I've just shown you about, a bit about the plant species that we're dealing with and some of the seasonal patterns that we'll see in chalk streams. But actually, why as conservation should we care about um, aquatic plants, certainly given that the chalk streams have so many other issues going on with them? Well, aquatic plants are fundamental to the chalk stream ecosystem. As I mentioned earlier, that ranunculus really is a keystone species, and it fulfills a huge number of different roles. First of all, aquatic plants, and in particular the bushy species such as ranunculus, provide a great deal of cover and refuge uh, for a whole range of organisms, in particular invertebrates and fish. They provide cover from predators, but also from the flow itself. And both as living tissues for herbivores such as swans, but also as uh, decaying and dying tissues for invertebrates, they produce a huge amount of food, which really powers the ecosystem, particularly in stretches like this, where you can see there's very little uh, tree cover along the bank to drop leaves to, to fuel the ecosystem. Much of the productivity relies on the in-stream production of macrophytes. I've mentioned a little bit already about the, the cover and refuge role, but it does more than that. The macrophytes within a, a reach of chalk stream really do both increase and diversify the range of habitat available for different species. Uh, some very much literally so, such as black folly larvae, which grow directly on uh, the macrophyte to gain access to the currents where they feed. Uh, aquatic plants are also important in water movement, where you have a, a section like this, where the uh, river channel is very much choked with macrophyte material. You find it holds back the water. Um, again, some of Hugh Dawson's work from the, the 1970s on the River Piddle found that the actual the river level in uh, where you had good growth of macrophytes actually rose by 0.7 metres relative to what it would have been in an unvegetated section. So you get a slower moving, deeper wetted area where you have uh, macrophytes in the channel holding back the water. Now, that has led to some instances of uh, cuts being necessary to avoid flooding to some riverside landowners, but that's less common these days, not least because uh, in many of our chalk streams, ranunculus isn't doing as well as it once did. Plants also play key roles in the nutrient cycles within chalk streams, both directly by taking up nutrients from the water and from the sediments, um, but also by changing um, sediment dynamics where water goes through uh, aquatic plant stands, it loses some of its energy, it deposits sediment, and I'm sure many of you have seen when you look at a stand of ranunculus, often there is a patch of sediment around the roots where a lot of microbial <laughs> process is important to nutrient cycles to take place. And also, the presence of aquatic plants also diversifies the range of water temperatures that you'll get versus a completely unvegetated section. So there's a whole range of different roles and functions that aquatic plants fulfil in chalk streams that help contribute uh, to the chalk stream ecosystem and make it the, uh, the diverse uh, and wonderful places that they are. Here's just a brief example uh, of what I was talking about with the uh, support for invertebrates. This is a study by J.F. Wright and his colleagues on the, uh, the river Kennet in, in Berkshire when they looked across four different sites comparing the density of invertebrates in patches of gravel and in patches of aquatic plants. And what they found was at each site, the uh, aquatic plant stands had more than twice the density of invertebrates um, within, within those compared to the gravel. So what I hope I've managed to partially convince you there is that aquatic plants within chalk streams support um, this really key community uh, that we see. And that in turn, in particular when we're talking about the macroinvertebrates which feed salmonid fish, can support important leisure activities such as angling. Many chalk streams are very valuable uh, game fisheries. But in the round, the importance of aquatic plants to the whole chalk stream ecosystem, um, the different roles they fulfil mean that um, they're, they're also been recognised. Uh, and We understand that the need to protect aquatic plants within these systems um, if we're going to conserve the whole. And there's a so a lot of conservation uh, legislation has now come in to try to help us uh, to conserve 
aquatic plants. In particular, from the EU, the Habitats Directive has done that. And many chalk streams now have at least some sections which are, for example, triple SIs. One in the case of the Hampshire Raven is a special area of conservation. So I've talked now a little bit about the species we're dealing with and about why these species are important. But, but I also mentioned earlier that there's actually a huge amount of variation between different reaches within a single river and between different rivers in both the species that we might get uh, and also in the patterns of abundance. And I want to talk for now for the rest of uh, the evening about some of the factors, some of the key factors which influence those patterns. And I'm going to talk about six key factors which influence particularly the abundance uh, of aquatic plants that you'll find within your chalk stream. Flow, uh, putting first because it actually has long been recognised as one of the key factors which determines how much plant material you will get within uh, a chalk stream reach. Um, we've known since the early days of river keepers that following on from low flows in the spring and early summer, we generally get poor ranunculus growth. And it was the work of Derek Westlake in the 1960s, uh, Daniel Dorset, we showed that actually ranunculus uh, does much better where you have a good flow on, on the water. It increases the photosynthetic rate and, it, and encourages uh, the transport of gases across the leaf to water membrane. And some recent work by Alex Pointer at the University of Birmingham has looked at this relationship between the flow of water and the growth and biomass of ranunculus in particular, in more generally aquatic plants, in chalk streams. And what he found was that the optimum growth in terms of the uh, growth of a stand from just a small shoot to a matured plant, um, the optimum growth recurred between about 0.3 and 0.5 metres uh, per second. Um, below that, um, which is a particular problem in many of our chalk streams where we have low flows, um, suboptimal growth and actually beyond uh, that once we get over about a, a current speed of about half a metre per second, we also start to see suboptimal growth. And he went on in more detail to actually look at the different forms of plants and to, to say why we might see this pattern. And in particular, it's worth noting that at high float speeds, the plant is actually having to invest more of its resources in rooting itself to the gravel so that it isn't uh, washed out by this, the stronger flow. Um, and also the fact that the flow itself is buffeting the plant and uh, dislodging bits of material so it suffers uh, doesn't photosynthesize as well and consequently doesn't grow as well but you can still get uh, a good crop a healthy crop of ranunculus at these higher speeds perhaps more worryingly is the the very low flow speeds um, which again you know just a, a big decrease in the overall biomass of ranunculus and this um, form which if you think back to what i was saying earlier about bushy macrophytes and how they support high densities of invertebrates this rather spartan growth form um, will not fulfil that role uh, quite so well. So there will likely be knock-on effects on the invertebrate community um, and other aspects of the Georgian ecosystem. Light, as with all plants, aquatic plants need to photosynthesise. They need light to do this. Um, and the work of Hugh Dawson from the 1970s showed this quite nicely, the relationship between the biomass of aquatic plants um, two different species here from chalk streams and the amount of light reaching water surface you get a good strong positive relationship the more light reaching the surface uh, the, the higher the biomass you get of aquatic plants the big problem in many uh, reaches of, of chalk stream is shading shading from riparian trees and our work from the river Froome recently showed this quite clearly a strong negative relationship between the percentage of the bank, which is covered by trees greater than three metres tall, and the actual aquatic plant biomass, you can see by the time you have around 50% of the bank covered by trees, you've lost virtually 50% of your aquatic plant biomass. And certainly at very high levels of shading, um, very little aquatic plant biomass is able to grow. Now there are, you'll notice this is the mean Line, and there are confidence intervals either side because obviously there's a, a lot of variation um, within a chalk streams. Some of that variation um, is related to the channel width. So generally, narrow ch uh, channels uh, tend to suffer more from shade than very wide rivers, simply for the fact that the trees themselves can't cast quite so much of a shadow over a very wide river. So particularly small, narrow chalk streams will suffer uh, relatively uh, worse from the effects of shading. 
Similarly, because we're in the northern hemisphere here and the sun is in the south part of the sky, trees that are on the southern bank of a chalk stream will cast more of a shadow, will block out more of light than trees on the north bank. Now, nature is rarely so neat and tidy that we have a perfect south and a perfect north bank, um, but that is something worth bearing in mind, particularly for those uh, who are interested in, in manipulating tree cover um, as part of restoration products, uh, that the south uh, bank is generally where the majority of shading will occur because that's where the greatest light limitation will occur. Related to this issue of uh, light limitation of aquatic plants, some more work from the River Froome and Piddle catchments uh, showed the effects that depth, and in particular depths above 1.3 metres, can actually lead to a situation where you have lower um, biomass of aquatic plants. Again, because water that deep, light is starting to struggle to penetrate through, even in what we think of as crystal clear chalk streams, there will generally be some turbidity in the water at some times. Uh, because chalk streams are so clear, above that 1.3 metres, so at shallower depths, there is no real relationship here. It's it's these three points here which are, are dragging that line down here. So generally at depths above 1.3 metres, depth doesn't really um, limit light reaching macrophytes and you can get very high biomasses. Beyond 1.3 metres, you may start to suffer uh, reduced biomasses. Nutrients are also um, a key issue with aquatic plants as they are with, with many other organisms in chalk streams. and. Uh, there were some nice experiments uh, done by Spink in the early 90s which showed the strong effects of phosphorus on, uh, in particular, ranunculus. Uh, he grew in experimental channels two, uh, uh, two concentrations of phosphorus. He grew ranunculus plants, one at 40 micrograms per litre and then at a much elevated 200 micrograms per litre. And then grew ranunculus plants under these two conditions for 100 days and looked at the biomass at the end. And this black bar here is the uh, set of plants that were grown <coughs> under the lower phosphorus conditions, and this is quite typical of a, of a chalk stream. Whereas at the elevated uh, phosphorus, you can see there's much lower uh, biomass compared with the low phosphorus treatment. And the second set of uh, two black bars were actually the, the same experiment repeated in the presence of Potomogeton species, so in the presence of a competitor. And you can see the same pattern again, where just the competitor present, there's still a good amount of growth there, whereas when the phosphorus is added again, uh, much less. And the real problem here is actually algal smothering of the plants themselves. At higher uh, nutrient concentrations, algae uh, grows very well in chalk streams, grows on the plants themselves, grows epiphytically on the plants, and stops light reaching the actual photosynthetic apparatus within the leaves and can actually kill the plant. Here's, it's not come out terribly well, but a photo from uh, the River Froome and you can see the plants covered um, in algae and actually dying off. This is uh, one of the, the sites lower down the river where there, there are quite high nutrient concentrations. Now, I mentioned earlier the, the two different nutrient concentrations. Unfortunately, there's been no further work which has tried to see whether it's a nice gradient between those two concentrations in plant performance or whether somewhere uh, the plant is able to grow quite well up until a certain point and then it gives up. But what we can see from looking at the phosphate concentrations in the River Froome over 40 years is that that 200 is certainly at the higher end of, of what we see but it's certainly not unreasonable and that uh, the majority of the concentrations of phosphorus within uh, the River Froome are certainly falling between those two levels. And that's why some of the recent reductions in phosphate concentrations are to be welcomed. These will certainly be good for the growth of ranunculus and other key chalk stream plants. Water temperature yeah, is another key factor. In particular for ranunculus and some of the, what I mentioned as the classic chalk stream species, so calitrochae and ranunculus, <laughs> Generally, once this is a typical uh, profile over time of the, how the temperature changes across the River Froome. Yeah. We found generally at sites where the temperature was at the higher end of that, we found lower ranunculus biomasses throughout the year. Um, however, what we did find is that some species, particularly some of uh, the species talked about earlier, such as Potomogeton, which perhaps not true chalk stream species, but do quite well under some of the changed conditions we've been getting of 
higher temperatures, higher nutrient concentrations, lower flows. We certainly see that they do quite well under it. So depending, the effects of temperature on a chalk stream plant community will largely depend then for on which species are actually making up the community. And the more species you have, such as Potter McGeaton, uh, comprising that community, uh, the less of a negative effect of temperature you might see. One factor which may not be such a much of an issue for um, <coughs> chalk streams in this area, but certainly has become a bit of a hot topic on some of the larger southern chalk streams, is grazing by mute swans. Now, there are a number of species within a chalk stream which do eat ranches, everything from water voles, to sometimes dace will have a, a go at some of the leaves. But a mute swan is by far and away the largest uh, herbivore that ranunculus or any other chalk stream plant is going to face. A 10 kilo bird like this can quite easily eat four kilos of ranunculus per day, which the main reason for that is because their digestion is so poor, unlike cattle who can ruminate and have bacteria to help them digest uh, the, the plant material they take in to break down the cellulose. Swans and other avian herbivores have none of those adaptations, unfortunately. So the amount of energy they actually get from a bite of aquatic plant is actually very low, which consequently they have to then eat more to compensate that to meet their, their daily needs. Now even a, a bird eating four kilos, ranunculus, if the conditions are good, is a plant that can grow very strongly and unless you're talking about a very small section of river, uh, the short river ecosystem should be able to cope with that. The problems really have occurred where we've had large flocks of swans. This is actually part of a 70 strong flock of swans which were living on 200 metres of chalk stream. <laughs> this is taken at the time of year when they molt their flight feathers and so can't go anywhere. So they arrive at these sites and they just eat everything above the gravel. And when we've actually looked um, to see what the effect of that is in the plants, understandably there are then strong negative effects on both the biomass and the cover of aquatic plants where these large flocks are feeding. This is the relationship uh, between uh, the number of swans, or the, the amount of swans, however you want to, to quantify it, uh, and it shows them how they deplete the biomass of aquatic plants. So roughly, where you've got uh, roughly 20 swans they can, feeding over the summer period, they will completely eliminate the above ground biomass of aquatic plants. Now, interestingly, this pattern doesn't then carry over into the following year, as we thought it would. The swans tend to leave the river once the autumn rains come, and the river becomes a bit more turbid, a bit faster flowing, the swans will then generally leave and go and feed in fields. What that does, because ranunculus has this really um, quite tough root network that really is all in the gravel, um, which the swans can't pull out, it allows then this, this break that the ranunculus gets as to when the swans leave, it allows the ranunculus to grow back from the roots, and then by the following spring, you wouldn't actually have ever known the swans were there which is quite good for the swan's point of view as well, because it means there's a regular source of plants that they can go back and harvest year on. Unfortunately, some of the conservationists and fishermen aren't too pleased about it, because um, when this grazing does remove so much of the aquatic plants, it, it removes the plant's ability to fill all those roles I talked about earlier. So there's no, no habitat in stream. There's no cover for invertebrates and for fish. It also has, uh, swan grazing also has an effect on the flowers, which I mentioned, and just as there's a strong negative uh, relationship between the number of swans and the abundance of plants, there's also that relationship between the number of swans and the number of stands which are flowering with any given one reach. So where there are 13 or more swans, generally the number of stands flowering will be halved, and around 26 swans or more will completely uh, ensure that no flowers are produced in that year. Typically that's because swans being on the surface will eat the tissues closest to them first and so where there are these high numbers of swans the plant just can never get to the surface. This is a slight problem given that there is this JNCC target for chalk streams that 25% of stands should flower. Now not more, more hasn't really been made. Well, ranunculus reproduces the relative portions of sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction and the thinking is that actually ranunculus does most of its reproduction asexually because it can grow very well from the fragments which are constantly being broken off by the flow and by other disturbances. But there's a, a lot of uncertainty there as to what role actual sexual reproduction from the flowers actually plays in the life cycle of ranunculus. So just to recap really now over some of the factors I've talked about and some of the 
threats to chalk streams um, which exacerbate them. So flow in particular, we all know very well that the river extraction and unsympathetic channel widening, for example, will cause low flow, and that's really going to have a big impact on the, the, the plants, particularly ranunculus, which is, as a flowing water plant does need a good flow in order to grow well uh, and to fulfil the number of ecological roles it does. Light, I've said excessive trees, because I certainly wouldn't want you, on the basis of this talk, to go and chop down all the trees in your <laughs> original ecosystem, because the trees themselves do, um, particularly where, where roots are growing in, into the water, provide a good habitat, they provide a source of woody debris for them, but they produce many good benefits to a chalk stream. But certainly where there's been perhaps no management for a while and a chalk stream is actually becoming slowly um, enveloped by a canopy of shade, that will have a big negative effect um, on chalk stream plants, as I've shown you. So certainly excessive trees in the road are a bad thing for, for aquatic plants. Also turbidity from a number of sources, perhaps soil runoff from fields, um, anything which, which limits the amount of light reaching the leaves of ranunculus. Similarly, overgrowth by algae, uh, for example, at higher nutrient concentrations, will have um, a strong negative effect on aquatic plants. Depth, again, because of the light limitation factor, having one or two deep holes within a chalk stream is, is not a problem, and actually, for, certainly for species such as fish, can actually be quite a good thing. But what you don't want is for large sections of the chalk stream to be over deep, perhaps as the result of historic dredging. <sighs> because that may have, um, that's certainly going to limit the uh, ability of ranunculus to grow and to achieve the kind of biomasses that we would want to allow it to fulfil its roles. Nutrients from human settlements and from agriculture, particularly um, sort of in recent years, have been having um, a big effect, exacerbated by low flows, which also impact on the plants. And that certainly has led to the emergence of altered plant communities, particularly in some lower stretches of the river. You, um, certainly we've seen it on the River Froome in the lower sections, large stands of Potomageton where, as in 10, 15 years ago, uh, these plants were present, but only in sort of trace quantities. They're now becoming more dominant in some of these lower reaches. And temperature, increasingly with, with climate change, I know, the Environment Agency has become quite interested in the use of trees to shade chalk streams, particularly given that, that salmonids, a cold water fish species, um, are particularly threatened by rising water temperatures in chalk streams. There's clearly, obviously, um, a bit of work here to be done to resolve uh, having enough trees to shade the water to try and reduce the temperature, um, but not having so many trees that you eliminate all the aquatic plants and all of course, all the problems that would cause. So I think there, there's certainly a bit of research that needs to be done to try to trade off those two desires in chalk streams. Um, and of course, grazing, certainly at the moment, does seem to be limited to some of the larger chalk streams in the south um, of England, where partly because with the wider channel, swans seem to prefer that as habitat. Um, some of the smaller chalk streams in the east of the country, for example, uh, don't seem to have the habitat that large flocks of swans like. But there has been, between sort of the late 1970s and the early 2000s, uh, there was a big increase in the mute swan population in Great Britain for a number of reasons, partly the banning of lead shot um, in angling and also the a greater amount of, of food available in the landscape once we switched from sowing our cereals in the spring to sowing them in the autumn, because traditionally winter is the lean time of year for any herbivore. Um, so now we've started growing these nice nutritious crops over the, the winter period. Um, there's been a huge a boost for the swan population in terms of the food available for them. But that does seem to have levelled off now slightly. So whether we'll actually see a continuing spread of the problem of swan grazing or whether actually it's reached its um, extent remains to be seen. So that's a sort of a whistle-stop tour through aquatic plants in chalk streams. Um, and yeah, some of the factors that I hope will, will be useful when you, you consider your own stretches of, of chalk stream and the plant communities that, that live there or hopefully live there. So thank you very much for listening.